Okay, hi everyone and welcome. My name is Ann Bennett. I'm the Executive Director of the Laurel Historical Society in Maryland. And I just wanted to welcome everyone if you are joining us live tonight uh, or you're watching this recording later, uh, you certainly are in for uh, a treat tonight as we talk about cookbooks and collecting and recipes uh, and really getting uh, involved in, in just fulfilling your passion uh, for collection and just kind of doing, doing what you love uh, and sharing that love and that passion with other people. Uh, and this is to support our current exhibit at the Laurel Historical Society called What's Cooking Laurel? And it's about recipes, restaurants, community cooking. So there's a heavy dose of nostalgia uh, with lots of recipes, a lot of history about uh, the restaurants uh, in the Laurel area. So we'll be talking a little bit more about that uh, at the end of our presentation. We'll give you all the information you need uh, in the chat box as well so that you can connect with us virtually if you are uh, some of those folks that are joining us internationally or across the country. Uh, and if you are local, then we definitely encourage you to stop by the Laurel Historical Society here in Maryland uh, and see our great new exhibit. We had a lot of fun putting it together. So I will just briefly introduce uh, the staff of the Laurel Historical Society, uh, Monica Sturdivant is our assistant director uh, and she'll be helping to monitor uh, the chat and the question as well. Uh, and uh, I don't wanna steal uh, our guest speaker's thunder, but uh, to keep you intrigued, uh, they have generally, generously uh, offered to give us a signed autographed copy uh, of Pamela's book. So this is the signed copy that we have at the Library and the Historical Society. Uh, and one lucky participant from tonight's live uh, recording or live webinar uh, will win a copy of Pamela's book. So stay tuned for the end. Monica will be uh, announcing the lucky winner for that as well. So Monica, is there anything you wanted to say before I introduce our speakers? Just welcome and I'm glad you all joined us and I cannot wait to see all of the, hear the stories about the cookbooks and I hope you're looking forward to it too. All right, well, thank you, Monica. And yeah, thank you so much again for joining us tonight. Uh, so I am so happy to uh, introduce and to welcome Pamela and Stephen with us tonight. Uh, and I found out about it because there's a local or regional group called the Historic Foodway Society of the Delaware Valley. And uh, they made an announcement about this cookbook or about this book on cookbooks that had just come out. And I knew that uh, I had to uh, ask Pamela if she would speak. Uh, and this was way back in like October or November or something like that, Pamela, I think yeah, so. You were actually the first one to buy the book. Okay. The yes. first purchaser, yay! <laughs> yeah, so to the Laurel Historical Society of copy number one. Uh, so we were really excited because we were really in the throes of developing the exhibit at the time and it just fit in so nicely with what we were talking about in terms of community cooking and how cookbooks can be really read as a social history. And so that's a lot of what we were talking about in our own exhibit. And so uh, it felt it just felt right uh, and they were available and just gracious enough to uh, help us with all the marketing and the autograph copy that we'll be raffling off later. So uh, I will I'll uh, go ahead and mute myself now, but I wanted to thank everyone again for attending tonight and I will pass it over to our speakers uh, and let you hear about uh, Pamela's amazing, amazing collection uh, and all the stories about cooking and her passion that have come from uh, her years uh, in the industry. So Pamela and Stephen, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you for having us. So the way this um, book came about, uh, when I, growing up in a family of uh, there was a total of eight or six kids in the family. Um, su supper, as we call it, not dinner, supper was a very important part of our, um, you know, daily lives at when my dad came home from work, five o'clock. After my dad had a shower, we sat at the, all eight of us sat at the kitchen table and ate supper together. But um, at an early age, I, I guess I could say at early age, I love to cook. And the early story I remember when I, when I was probably maybe five or six, my mom said that I could either have a birthday party or an easy bake oven, and I chose an easy bake oven. So I guess that was my leeway into what would become my passion, my future, anything with food and cooking. So my cookbook passion 
came about when I started working at William Sonoma. And that was like, I explained, I was a kid in a candy store, anything, everything about food, there was cookbooks for me to explore. Um, it was just, you know, it wasn't a job for me. So probably after I was there six months, I got promoted to the store manager and would attend the conferences in Scottsdale, Arizona. In that time, I would make sure I spent time with the founder, Chuck Williams, and he would share stories with me. And I told him about my interest in um, cookbooks. And he said, the cookbook you need to buy or the book is Clementine in the Kitchen by Phineas Beck. So that started it for me. Um, after that, I started collecting more books or venturing into actually, oh, antique stores. Um, that, that was my first one. stores all over. Yeah. I should jump in and introduce myself. Oh, yeah. Oh, my <laughs> I'm actually Pamela's sous chef and I'm the <laughs> editor of her book. And you have to realize after all those years, her collection has grown to be 3,000 books. So when you see the front cover, you're only you seeing see. just a little bit. Yeah. This is, in fact, only a little bit. There are several other rooms of cookbooks. And what I'd like to point out is that she has created this over a period of years. And in this book, she has divided it in different categories we're going to be speaking about tonight, where there's going to be about stars, celebrities, how <clears throat> since this is Women's History Month, the basically the evolution of women in the kitchen, technology, and the various changes in society. And one of the things, and the reason I'm speaking right now, is we're pleased to announce that Pamela's cookbook has won Best in the World from Puramon International. This is out of about 135 countries, and she was selected for a special award. And I'll just read what the president of Gourmand International said. He basically said that your book is a real treasure, most interesting and well-written. It brought back many happy memories. So that was, I was very excited. I would love to be able to accept the award, but it's in Sweden. So um, fingers crossed, maybe we'll get to make it to the award ceremony. Um, so going back to collecting cookbooks, this is a picture of Chuck Williams, myself, and two other sales associates, uh, my friend Tina and my friend Lyndall. Um, that's what started my cookbook collecting, this one book. So I started venturing out to antique stores, um, just interested in cookbooks. And one thing led to another. So the thing that really started it is the book called... Um, yeah. Oh, shoot. Oh, this Clementine in the Kitchen by Phineas Beck. So that was a, a great stories. Just, you know, I was intrigued by these older books. They, I don't know why the older books, they talked to me and they just felt good to have, my, have them in my hand. So one of the other things she did when she was at Williams-Sonoma, she was in charge of all the famous authors that would come through and one just happened to be Julia Child. And so what, how this came about, Julia Child, her book, The Way to Cook, was just released. And we were fortunate enough to do an event with her at the Rialto Theater in Joliet, Illinois. Um, she did an onstage cooking demonstration. So like I said, very fortunate to have met Julia Child. One of the things that we can know from Julia Child is she probably learned when she went to France about this cookbook, which is 1899. It's all in French. And she ended up having this. In fact, this was in the movie. Well, this cookbook was the, if you watch the movie, Julia and Julia, her husband, Paul, gave this to Julia as a gift for her birthday. So, of course, I don't read French, but I had to have it in my collection. And it's wonderfully illustrated also. Therefore, in Pam's collection, this led to a copy of purchasing this thing, which you can't <laughs> see because of the glare. One of the things Pam does in collecting her cookbooks, she wraps every single book in mylar protection. But this one is signed and she has a collection of about five or six uh, books. And in her book, she says she doesn't cook from all the books, but she has a grouping of Julia Child books that she appreciates. And one important thing about Julia's book if you know you have a first edition, if it's red on the top, this is a first edition, first printing. So it is a highly sought after edition. One of the things, as we said, the book is broken out into chapters. We'll just give you some examples of some of that for your uh, understanding of what the book's about. 
Okay, this is a section on restaurants. So I'm sure everybody's heard about the Brown Derby cookbook. And when, you know, we just didn't put a picture of the cookbook and a picture of a recipe. We did research about the books. And one interesting story about the, this book is if you, the Brown Derby first manager, his name was Robert Cobb. So he was also the creator of the Cobb salad. So that's how the Cobb salad became evolved. And you'll see that throughout the uh, uh, presentation today, as well as in the book itself, there's a lot of in interesting trivia in historical areas. And this is another example of um, farms and inns. Uh, this is one, the, the books, I guess, from my favorites were around from the 1940s, but this was the White Turkey Inn which um, I'll just read it's so outside of Danbury, Connecticut, had been built for a bridal company, company, yeah, company in 1760 and gained the reputation as being haunted by happiness. The house at the turn of the century became an English style tea house, later an inn owned by Harry and Dorothy De Vega. When the Second World War, as we say, as have seen with other rural eateries, imposed gas and food rationing, the, the De Vegas shifted the New England theme into New York City and opened a white turkey townhouse. And after 1948, several of the white turkey locations sprang up in the city. So this is one of the things, one of the entrance to this chapter is a quote by the uh, 1700s author, Samuel Johnson, where he says, the finest landscape in the world is improved by a good inn in the background. And so this chapter has a lot of famous uh, restaurants that are inns and farms. Uh, then we end up going into A Date with the Dish. This is an interesting book and Pam's gonna have a story on it, but this is probably the first African-American cookbook uh, that was produced that was in the modern period of time, basically 1954 and was supported by Ebony Magazine. In fact, the author was the food columnist for Ebony Magazine. And this was very important. And uh, Pam has an example of it being signed. Yeah. Go ahead and talk about it. And, and actually, when my in my search for no, this right there. In my search for cookbooks, you know, back in 1997, I think when eBay, uh, yeah, eBay was kind of just launched. There, I, that's where I used to look for cookbooks. And back then, I used to go about how many pages of cookbooks there were. I think there was like 21 pages of cookbooks. Now there's tens of thousands of cookbooks. So um, that's how I would find unusual cookbooks. So later I came across uh, a collection of books that were being offered for sale. And it was this, okay, the date with the dish, but it's to Mary Margaret McBride. It says, may each date with your dish be worthy of your time. You are so gracious and great, sincere, always free to tonight. And this man had a whole, well, it's a lot of cookbooks that were from Mary Margaret McBride's collection that were signed, were given to her, signed by the author um, for her, she had a radio show. Uh, she was actually one of the most famous radio personalities back in the 30s and 40s. When she retired and she was on NBC radio, basically they rented Yankee Stadium and they filled it with 75,000 people to announce her retirement. That's how popular she was. So here's what we call a, a tie-in to somebody famous from somebody famous. And this is a very interesting, I'll point out again, and the chapter of this book is, is kind of in several different fashions. One, it's called uh, Social Studies. And basically it shows again, the transformation of our society through the previous years. For instance, in African-American culture, we have books going from the Jim Crow period through the modern uh, African-Americans. We have uh, cookbooks from famous celebrities, African-American singers, and we also have a social mores of the changing of women in the workplace, going into single women, going into the single period. Believe it or not, we have a section on single, swinging singles. We have the first gay uh, cookbook. We have the coverage that shows how America has changed. It makes it very exciting when you start reading the background of these books. So I think the other thing that we need to do is talk about some of the fun cookbooks that you can go out and acquire. Okay, this is, I guess this would be one of my favorite stories. 
Ruth Wakefield. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Ruth Wakefield, but tried in two recipes. This is, I, I remember when I purchased this cookbook, I was in an antique store in Naperville, Illinois, down in the basement, going through cookbooks, and I came across this cookbook, and it happened to be signed. I was so excited. Okay, please. I was so excited that it was a signed copy by Ruth Wakefield. So in doing research, okay, if anybody, does anybody recognize this house right here and this title? Ruth Wakefield, Toll House, Tried in Two Recipes. Her and her husband bought this inn in Whitman, Massachusetts, and it used to be a toll house that the buggies would pay their tolls. So they turned it into this restaurant. The toll, of course, we had to collect postcards that went along with you know, the cookbook, or we collected the whole story, not just the book. So we have lots of paper and from there that would go along with the book. So if you looked at an older package of nesting uh, morsels in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see the picture of the inn. And this is how the Toll House chocolate chip co cookie came about. Back in the cookbook, she said, if you can read this recipe on the right-hand side here, it says, you take two economy size bars, seven ounce each, and cut them into sizes of peas. So what she expected to happen was that this pieces of chocolate were gonna melt and they're actually, they're first called chocolate crunch cookies. They didn't melt. So that's how the chocolate chip cookie came about. And of course I have the original pamphlet of this is what Nessie semi-sweet chocolate used to look like. That's a picture of it, example. And just to note, all this paper ephemera, I have another whole sub collection. I have over five to 700 pieces of this type of ephemera. They're all in binders by category. You know, I, one I have on yeast, one, just all these different subcategories. So that's a picture of the little pamphlet that goes along with the Toll House cookies. One of the additional things that happens in Pamela's book is again, the evolution in the culinary is what happened when the automobile came into existence and what highways happened. And so she ended up collecting Ford uh, Motor Company's favorite recipes from famous eateries around the country. Okay, go ahead. So that's, that's, that's another that, one. That's the actual first the first uh, edition of the- How many question. copies different I, books of these? I only have five, I, because then later they got bigger and different and I didn't care for them. I like the first five um, editions that came out. This is an example of one of the uh, pages in the book. Yeah, it's this Maddie's Tavern. We actually came upon this restaurant and when we took a trip to Los Oslivos. So it's kind of cool when you're looking through something like, oh my God, this place still exists. So, and now I, it's a, uh, an inner resort was built around the this old restaurant. Yes, and another page we have is one of the Brown Palace, which is in Denver from where I am, and it has a recipe on it too. So there's a lot of different restaurants all across the country. You find these and you can see if the restaurants are still existing or if they've gone out of business, which is a sad state. In fact, going back a little bit and point out in our book, when you look at the Toll House uh, restaurant, uh, about several years after yeah. she died, the restaurant burned down. And you'll see a lot of that when you realize that restaurants were impacted by World War II, by shortages of various supplies like sugar and butter, and by the change in, again, people's taste of staying home or going to local restaurants. Blueberry Hill, this cookbook, I have, I think, five of her books by Elsie Masterton. Her biscuit recipe is a very famous biscuit res recipe. It's uh, biscuits. <laughs> yeah, biscuits. So, and we actually contacted her daughter too, didn't we? Yeah. Right. Yeah. What, what is interesting about this is that they bought an inn up in, I believe, uh, Vermont yeah. and ended up thinking that this would turn into a great ski place and it had a drought for several years, so they barely broke even. And she writes into this cookbook and into her other cookbook, uh, she went through a cancer scare and her daughter took over afterwards. And, and her created... yeah, her daughter wrote a book called Elsie's Biscuits with some of the old recipes that were actually from the inn. So I have that cookbook too, of course. <laughs> so, so a cookbook leads to a cookbook leads to a cookbook. <laughs> 
Okay. The, um, this is hotel. Um, this is the Greenbrier, and this is to show you we can jump from inns and farms to Grand Dois establishments. And the reason we chose this one is this chef was very famous during a period of time. And one of the things Pam does, she goes through some things she likes, some things she doesn't, and she may end up selling something. Yeah. One of the things she had here, which I wanted her to keep. <laughs> well, you know, because I'm, I like to, I, I always say I'm fine tuning my cookbook collection. And, you know, you find a different interest or you need room to make room for something else. So I, every once in a while, I will go through things. And we found at an antique store, uh, it was called the Green Buyer Menus. And the chef had collected menus from all events they did at the Greenbrier. The Greenbrier. So I told my husband, let's see if we could sell this. Put it on eBay. Somebody, and I, I started real low. Somebody bought it for two, over $200. I'm like, everything has a value for someone. But um, I don't know why she bought it. But It had presidential uh, menus from the White House. It had various famous uh, menus and uh, occasions. It was, it was very fun. A uh, little small thing to do. But again, you fine tune your collection. Which brings us to the next area is we have a section on immigration. This yeah. is very important to us, and Pam is very big in ancestry. Yeah. So uh, Lewis and I wish I knew how to pronounce his name. We think it's Smith Smith Mari, <laughs> um, Hungarian, but he had a cookbook collection of over four hundred thousand cookbooks. And boy, oh, would have I and it, you know paper infirmera menus. I would have loved to visit his. Uh, collection and maybe it was yeah in Illinois so yes. we're near the Chicago area. One of the interesting things about this gentleman's life is that he was in World War II both a prisoner of the Russians and a prisoner of the Germans. When he came to Chicago he ended up being the personal chef for the armor uh, meatpacking company and ended up helping them believe it or not develop fast foods when that industry started taking off. So a lot of his collection was donated to universities around the country that specialize in culinary uh, teaching. So we find that very interesting. And again, stories within stories. And immigration is Pam's uh, background uh, has allowed her to go into baking back in the areas of her uh, family history. And so it's no doubt she- yeah. Well, yeah, growing up, um, you know, I said, supper or meals were very important in our family and at the age of 14 I learned how to make pizza. it's a sweet yeast dough that's rolled paper thin it's either filled with a honey nut filling or a poppy seed filling and the Slovenians Women Union of America contains several recipes for pizza. Um, but I have a whole collection from probably from early 1930s to 1960s on Slovenian, Hungarian, Czech, Hungary, what's, I'm just looking over at a, um, you yeah. even have a Blue Danube cookbook. Yeah, Blue Danube. So very important that I, uh, you know, my heritage. And one of the other, here's another immigration story that uh, shows Pam's encompassing all forms of cookbook in the story surrounding them. And this is one of my, this is one of my favorite cookbooks. When, back when I was working at Williams Sonoma, a friend of my aunt's, knew about my love for cookbooks and they had purchased this old home in Chicago, Illinois. And when they purchased the home, everything was left behind in the home. So in there was gourmet magazines. They were from 1950 to 1955. She gave them to my aunt to give to me. So I started reading these magazines and in, oops, in there, there was this story about Kadish, our Russian cook. And this is Gourmet Magazine. This one is from 1945. So of course, these they were just beautiful. Number one, the covers were like works of art. They were such interesting reading. And in there, I read about the story about Kadish. This is, I know it's hard to see, but this is a story about Kadish. So in reading that, um, every month there was a article about a story about Kadish. Later on, I see that they finally came out with the cookbook Kadish. So of course I started my search and I had to find Kadish, our Russian cook. And a bit of um, interesting tidbit is to date, Kadish's cheesecake is the most requested recipe from Gourmet Magazine. 
And it, actually, it's a very good cheesecake recipe. So we can hold that up here. It's just, it's a paper thing of Katie's uh, recipe. But what we point out is uh, you can go online and probably find this recipe. If you can't find it, we'd be happy to email it to you. Uh, contact the hostess at the Laurel uh, Maryland Historical Society and we'll send something to you with the cheesecake recipe. So just want to let you know. I want to talk about collecting right now. Ah, uh, this, is, this is another one of my favorite books, the Macaroni Manual. Now, Macaroni Manual, all there is to know about spaghetti. Where's the word pasta? <laughs> so this is a book that was published by Barrow's Cookbooks. So of course, the way I would search for cookbooks, when you purchased a book, back then they would list other books by the publisher. So on this one, of course, they listed so I know several of the books that were purchased by Barrow's Magazine or Barrow's the publisher. I would literally make a list on a tablet. And back then, well, I should say back to 1990, 91, um, you didn't have the internet to do the research or they had at your fingertips to find books. Now it's super easy. So with a list in hand, I would hit antique stores, searching out more of these books. And one of the criteria when I was searching for the books, I wanted to get a first edition. I wanted it with a dust jacket because, you know, for instance, here's a book with the dust jacket and then the book without the dust jacket you know, it, it's just, you, I, I, that was one of the criteria. Maybe this is a good point just to talk for a few minutes about cookbook collecting and what we look at. Uh, if you're collecting, say, a normal fiction book, first edition, you would want it first edition, you would want it pristine and in good shape. When it comes to cookbooks, you actually want to acquire a cookbook that you enjoy, that you cook from. But if you are actually looking for uh, collecting them as looking for something you might appreciate or pass down to the next generation. You should always try and find the best quality of it. But sometimes if you just want the book, you end up getting the fifth, sixth, or seventh printing of it until you can find a first edition. But it's a fun, not only a hobby, but a good vocation because it's educational. As you see, we're kind of giving you history and background, and it's a fun thing to do. I also, uh, uh, just a funny story, the macaroni manual. I remember a story when I was at my dad's business, we were in the office talking, and family upon family worked for all the family businesses. And my uncle Lyle came in and he says, Pammy, he said, I went to the, the grocery store and he said, the recipe called for pasta. He says, I couldn't find pasta anywhere. I'm like, Uncle Lyle, <laughs> I mean, Back then you didn't have the wide variety. I said, pasta encompasses everything, macaroni, spaghetti, but really back then, I should say back then, probably in the eighties, you, you, you found macaroni, spaghetti. Um, what else there might've been, oh, maybe lasagna, but there wasn't all these other, you know, maybe penne. So that, that's a story I like. I wanna do something, I wanna do the famous uh, commercial break for a second and tell you that Pam's book, took about 10 years to come together. A lot of different uh, issues that happened, including we had one publisher and that fell through and we had to uh, redo the book. And luckily we have a historic publisher, History of Books came along and published this book. And for tonight and tomorrow only, as they say in the pitch business, uh, they're giving a reduced uh, special deal Especially. on the book. And you can approach them at History of Books dot com or info at historybooks.com and see if that's a book that you would want to start out as kind of both your history as well as your formulative uh, cooking guide, so to speak, which brings up that we're looking at this macaroni grill. Macaroni manual. But the macaroni is written by Crosby Gage. And what's interesting is all of a sudden, here's Crosby Gage and we run across a bunch of his books. And in Pam's book, she has a chapter, which I step into, which is men at work in the kitchen. And she comes up with a lot of cookbooks that are by bon vivants of the times. And this includes everybody from Lucius Bede, who owned rail cars, to James Beard, to Crosby Gage. And Crosby Gage, as an example, was president of the International uh, Food and Wine in New York. He started a lot of international societies. So basically you run across a lot of these people and he had a, a large gathering of friends because he was also 
in the theater business. So he was a, a good person to find. And a lot of their books were fun reads and they brought all their friends in to supply recipes. Another one, of course, was Charles Brown. Charles Brown was the, uh, both the mayor of Princeton, New Jersey, as well as a member of Congress during the, uh, one of his congressmen was Volstad, which created the Prohibition uh, Act. So he also was a famous uh, bone vivant during the time. And it's not also to say we have bone vivants in Pam's book who are on the women's side, which included uh, people like uh, Elsa Maxwell and Lord, uh, Lady Mindell, who was Elsie DeWolf. And those are fun people to read about also in their adventures and the lifestyles they lived during the period of that time. And also um, these books back then, it's, they had a lot of great illustrations. Um, they're, they're just, they're fun to look at. You can almost take them out of the book and frame them. Ah, the stars, celebrities. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, these books are actually highly sought at. They're not like the current ones today, but I probably have had I have 30 or 40 of these cookbooks of the stars. We have recipes from Liberace, Johnny Mathis, Humphrey Bogart, Dinah Shore, and even Elsie the Cow, and <laughs> their cookbooks that they had. And El speaking of Elsie the Cow cookbook, um, my mom, my mom's name was Elsie. So when I, of course, I had to find that cookbook and I bought myself a copy and I had to purchase one for my mom. So if you get into celebrities, here's another cookbook that Pam ran across. Sophia Loren, the way, and you know, like, how do you know these cookbooks are out there? I was reading an article in a magazine and it was about Sophia Loren. And they talk about when she became pregnant with her child, she was ordered to bed rest. So when she was um, in her apartment, so she decided to write this book, Sophia Loren in the Kitchen with Love. And I was lucky enough to, then I would go out and of course search for the book. And I was lucky enough to find a uh, purchase a signed copy of her book. One of the things that happened when Pam does the research on the books, we stumbled into making friends along the way. And here's a good example. Uh, this is some artwork that was given to us after we talked to the person and we asked if we could put her book into Pam's cookbook collection. And this is, oh, oh. I stepped it a second, but basically this is the lady of Alice of Alice's Restaurant. This is uh, the one that Arlo Guthrie wrote a famous book about the massacre at Alice's Restaurant. And so we have a signed copy from her, and she sent us this artwork. I had ordered that. Okay. Yeah. And here okay. we have um, Vincent Price. Now, uh, he was actually a very good cook. Um, he loved cooking for people. This was, uh, I remember the first time I saw this book was at a friend's house. And it's a beautiful book. It's like a padded bronze cover. And I actually have a signed copy of that. I'm actually a signed copy of him. Whenever <laughs> my husband and all the sub collections, when I would get a cookbook, he'd go out looking anything that would tie in with the cookbook. He'd buy autographed pictures of the author. He tried to find postcards of the, um, the place, restaurant location. or place, which was great because we have that in another whole binder. There's a picture of Vincent Price doing a tasting. Okay, this is... Pam wants to talk about this one. We're getting into regional ones. We want to do, since we're in the area, we want to do Connecticut and Maryland. And here is the Connecticut cookbook. And Pam wanted to read you a section of this. If you have a second. Yeah, well, and see, like I said, we investigate the cookbooks. We in investigate who wrote it, if, see if there's any sub stories along with that. So on this, we have a side note about this book in my book. It says, how often do we investigate the contributor? So I noticed several recipes by contributor Mrs. J.B. Endor in the cookbook. And then lo and behold, on the front cover, jacket photo taking in her own Connecticut, ki Connecticut kitchen is this Nell Dorr. So this woman on the cover is Nell Dorr. Um, and an interesting story about that is that, uh, let's see, in, um, she was a major photographer specializing after 1954 when her young daughter died in photographing mothers and daughters trying to memor memorize her own lost child, 
her own lost child. In 1955, she appeared in the Family of Man exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art, presented by Edward Steichen. Her photo contribution, her friend and neighbor, illustrator Tasha Tudor, nursing her son, Tom. And what about hubby, Dr. John Van Nordstrom Dorr, a successful metallurgical engineer and inventor, began his career as a 16 year old assistant to Thomas Edison. So see how all these stories tie into specific people. But as the story goes, Nell Dorr complained one night coming home in the rain to the Connecticut home that the glare from oncoming cars made her momentarily blind and that her car, dri her car drifted towards the center line white markings. Vulnerable to fatal side swiping, John Doerr, her hus husband, invest investigated as an inventor and determined a solid white line on the road shoulder would have given drivers a correct away from the road center. So who to thunk? So because of that, that's how this the white lines on the side of the road came about because of this, what happened with them. Things are fascinating and fascinating. That's why we like this. Uh, let me try and do the next one. I have to do this. Give us a second here. It's right here. Made it. Oh, we made it too small. Oh, shoot. Oh, oh, oh. Bear with us one second. What happened? Maybe we're yeah. down there. There we go. Ah, we knew we'd get to Maryland sooner or later. Oh, no. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, let's see. Stop sharing. Hold on once you soon share. Oh, you're there we go. We'll see it. Okay, we're there. Yep. Okay. Looking forward uh, to hearing it. Okay. okay. Well, this is an interesting one in a certain way. This is uh, Eat, Drink, Be Merry, Maryland. This was by Frederick Philip Steiff, and he was the son of the family of the piano Steiff family out of Baltimore. And he was an amateur uh, chef, and he collected both recipes as well as stories and had an artist do uh, a lot of the pictures of the old homes in Maryland during this period of time. And during in this book, he was one that would call all the recipes as it was done in the 1800s and the 1700s, he'd call them receipts. And that's the way they were known before they were known as recipes. And this book is a six printing. And the first edition, if you had that, would be running about $500. And it's about only one of them on the market. And one of the interesting ones, Pam from this book, uh, pulled a dessert out called Peach Foam and had a drawing, took a page of it, and it was St. Mary's, uh, which was put into that page. So one of the things that it was in this is he also did a lot of in the appendix. He did a lot of interesting luncheon menus. And one was a luncheon menu in 1857 by the Grand Banquet of Railway Celebrations. So it's a, it's a real interesting uh, book that's really a lot of history as well as recipes. And we found that a very fun thing to uh, look through and read and selecting the right recipe for our book. The other one we want to do is, if I can do this right now, yeah. is 50 Years in a Maryland Kitchen. Okay. Now, this is an interesting book because this is really pure history. Mrs. B.C. Howard, actually was born in 1809, and she died in, I believe, around 1890. Uh, she lived for about 85 years, and she died in 1890. She had 12 children, so she did spend 50 years in the kitchen. <laughs> but what was interesting in this thing is her recipes were actually maintained very well during that time with all the ingredients and done right. So when the family turned them over to Florence Brobeck, she revised them so they would be ready to be printed in the vernacular of 1944. And I point out in a certain way because uh, Florence Brobeck is somebody, and we're talking again Women and Women History Month, she was a very well-known food writer. She wrote both for the New York Herald and for the columnist for the New York Times. And she wrote a lot of best-selling cookbooks. Uh, and that was, one of the things that we chose in, in this book too. So again, you can go into this area and you can get a lot of history about the Maryland background. And I'd like to point out at, the, at this point too, is that there is a, a blog, a Maryland blog that specializes in old Maryland cookery and cookbooks. And it's done by, I believe it's called, uh, 
a lady by the name of uh, Kara May, if I get that right, and she has a blog called oldlineplate.com, oldline, L-I-N-E, plate.com, and she has a recipe index of many fine foods from the Maryland region. So I point that out as a side note. So we hope that you have a chance and we appreciate again the uh, Laurel uh, Society for having us, but we have a few other little side things to do. Hope we aren't boring you. <laughs> we do side collections. My wife, Pamela. He does. <laughs> picked on me, but I got excited about sign menus. So we have a grouping of sign menus in the cookbook that specializes. And this one is a fun one. This is from the Starlight Roof at the Waldorf Astoria. And it's signed by Guy Lombardo, the famous orchestra leader that was well known uh, for doing the old Anzine thing on New Year's Eve. And again, it's fun to look at old menus because the prices are ones we wish we could afford to pay these days. Uh, some of the other recipes or menus we have is a Jack Dempsey's restaurant in New York City, yeah. and it's signed by Jack Dempsey. You can see right here. And you can see it's a well-used menu. But we have several other menus signed by famous people. We even have a fun one in the book, which is a facsimile of the last luncheon on the Titanic, but it's actually signed by the last living survivor of the Titanic, who was something like 10 months old when the Titanic sunk. So that makes history fun, and we enjoy doing that and it's tied into food. <laughs> what well, Pam also has her collections too. Okay, I, I was talking about the gourmet magazines and uh, that gift that was given to me those five years of gourmet magazine, it's top to date one of my favorite things I've ever received. So of course I had to venture out and try to collect all the gourmet magazine. The first year it was published was in January, 1941. So I have every issue from January, 1941 to, um, they were actually like watercolors, as you see on the front cover till through 1958. And so I quit collecting them after 1958. But that and and the first year was the only year I was missing. And then when for a wedding present, when we got yeah. married, my husband surprised me and had purchased the first year of Gourmet Mag, the first, yeah, the first complete year of Gourmet Magazine for a wedding present. And like I said, these, the Gourmet Magazines are my most prized possession. And in Gourmet Magazine, what which one's missing, December? Uh, December 41, they didn't print it because of Pearl Harbor. Yeah, so the first year only contains 11 magazines. And Gourmet Magazine, um, I had contacted them and they were looking for old issues and I told them I had all these and they asked if I wanted to give them to them. I said, uh, no, nope. I'm sorry. <laughs> One of the other collections that Pam did early on and it's grown into another whole wall is basically? The, the paper ephemera. This is, like I said, I have probably over five to 700 of these. And the artwork is just, you can't see this very well, but this just shows you the booklet and how she puts them into the books. Yeah. I'm an extremely organized person. Um, just like all this paper ephemera, all these little ephemera uh, cookbooklets are categorized by binders. They're in acid free page protectors. Um, I don't let anybody borrow them. They can look at them, <laughs> but I'm, it's, my, it's just something I'm, I'm just really proud of. And I just, the joy that they bring when you put one of these in your hands and just the artwork. And this one, actually, my sister Debbie got me this for a uh, Christmas present one year. And the illustrations of these are absolutely beautiful. You can now understand why Pamela's collection, which is over 3000 cookbooks, and we had to name the book, My Cookbook Passion is well-deserved. But of course the husband steps in with his little short commercial. <laughs> but Pamela's uh, especially right now is yes. making uh, ancestral family tradition of Patissa. Mm -hmm. And she actually sells this, it's been very successful. And she enjoys doing it. So just letting you know that's available. Yeah, so. that's, and yeah, I, I learned to make this when I was 14 years old, have been making it every year since then. And probably about, everybody said, why don't you sell? I'm like, I am not selling it. So I finally gave in about five years ago. And I have shipped to all but six states in the United States. And the people around the world are actually contacting me to ask if I could ship it. But um, it, it just won't make it. You know that it won't make the journey 
it, it's shipped fresh, so there's no ingredients for longevity, so it has to be eaten fresh. Uh, also, my commercial is uh, Pam and I spent 10 years over in Hawaii and we created a, I wrote a book. Not every, we for 10 years or more, we didn't live there for 10 years. Summer times. <laughs> but basically this is a culinary mystery with 22 recipes from the top chefs on the big island. And this is also available too. So we hope you've had a good time and join and romping through us with Pam's collection. Here's some background information that you can do if you wanna contact us. And if you wanna to write to her or you can follow her on Facebook. She has an active uh, Facebook page. My, yeah, and my kitchen is stores where I post all my cooking and little interesting tidbits and everything. So we'd be happy to answer any questions anybody in the web ionosphere of the net wants to ask us. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking such a, a short time out to talk about such a large collection. Uh, I want to jump in with just a few announcements from our end, and that'll give us a chance to look through some of the questions uh, and comments that have come through. Um, and then uh, while I'm doing that, also, Monica, if you want to uh, pick, a, pick a number at random and assign it to one of our attendees, uh, we'll do that. Uh, so I am actually going to switch and I'm going to start to share my screen, but all of this information um, will be shared in a follow up email. So I'll send out an email to everyone attending uh, today with all of the links that uh, we have shared tonight for future webinars, as well as the link to uh, the book sales. Uh, so we'll have all that information and again, all of the contact information to follow them on Facebook. Um, so I just want to do this real quick. And, and one quick one thing, believe it or not, that was this is my first Zoom call. <laughs> uh, OK, so just real quick, uh, you should be seeing our logo for our exhibit. So what's cooking Laurel restaurants, recipes and community. And it's just as you can tell by the logo, it's really a, a fun take on food. And we're really looking at the past, present and future. So we're looking at the closed restaurants, uh, but we're also profiling the current restaurants and food businesses in Laurel. Uh, we have uh, a highlights uh, display of our cookbook collection here that we have in the historical society as well as ones that have been loaned to us. Uh, we have timeline room talking about iconic foods, uh, talking about the original farm to table movements uh, that was in Laurel and all the different farms and the early grocery stores uh, in a main street and along Route 1 as well. Uh, so if you can come in person to visit us here in Maryland, uh, you, I'll share our website and you can look us up online and connect with us uh, see our past webinars, uh, as well as some of our upcoming virtual events. Uh, but for those of you who are able to visit us here in Maryland, our exhibit is open Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from 12 to 4. It's free admission. Uh, and we are a small museum. We're located in a historic mill workers house uh, built around 1840. So there's a uh, small space, but a lot to see, especially for this exhibit. So we hope that you'll come and check us out. Uh, and then just a couple of quick reminders. I'll put this in the chat as well, but we do offer membership. Uh, through our historical society that supports us throughout the year. Uh, and then if you are inclined and able, uh, we will gladly take a donation for the virtual program tonight uh, to support uh, other programming that we're able to do throughout the year. Uh, and then we also have a couple uh, other webinars scheduled for, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the spring. Uh, our next one is in April for celebration of Archaeology Month in Maryland. Uh, for those of you who know, I've been pushing that the past couple of years. Uh, and this is a great uh, intersection of archaeology and Native American food. And so uh, you don't often find an archaeologist who is a professional chef, but uh, we have. <laughs> There's one in Maryland. Uh, so Dr. Henry Ward is going to be talking to us about uh, his experience uh, cooking and bringing uh, to life uh, some of the, the recipes and the foodways and, and the uh, implements that he has also found archaeologically in the grounds. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and then in May, we are going to uh, be joined by Kaylin Thomas. She's going to be talking about uh, African American cooking uh, and travel uh, based on her experiences as a storyteller and in the cultural heritage um, tourism 
uh, field. So she's going to be talking to us uh, about her travels and about her upcoming book. Uh, she's a great speaker and we're really happy to get a different kind of more philosophical uh, wor uh, worldwide perspective on food as it intersects with travel uh, and with ethnicity and just her uh, great perspective on all of her um, experience uh, being a CNN reporter as well. So we're really excited to have her come out in May. Uh, and then again, this is our contact information. I'll put it in the chat if you need to contact us tonight, uh, but look out for a follow-up email from me as well. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so we can take a look at um, some of the questions they have been coming through. There's one thing I wanted to pick out of the chat real quick, um, but I'm just going to check in with Monica. Have you uh, picked out our winner yet? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, should we do a drum roll? Uh, who is going to get the uh, signed <laughs> autograph copy uh, from Pamela? So the winner of the cookbook is Maria Gonzalez Jackson. Yay. Hey, congratulations. All right. Congratulations. Uh, so I, everyone, again, will um, get an email, but uh, Maria, I will follow up with you or Monica will, uh, and we'll get your contact information so we can know uh, how to send that to you. So uh, for those of you uh, who didn't get a copy of it, uh, we have a copy now in the library at the Historical Society, uh, and it will be on display as well for Women's History Month at the museum. So if you can uh, make it to the museum, you're welcome to come and browse the copy as well. Uh, just one more thing, uh, Monica, before we kind of uh, peek into the Q&A there, if we wanted to look at those messages real quick. Uh, there was a comment earlier, uh, and this is something that I wanted to point out as well, because we do have a reproduction copy of it in our exhibit, uh, and that is talking about the first uh, African-American cookbook uh, written by uh, it, kind of the first African-American female um, cookbook is 18 was published in 1866 by Melinda Russell, and that's called a domestic cookbook. Uh, yes. And we have a reproduction copy of that on display in our exhibit. Uh, and it's a really uh, great uh, piece of literature. It gives her uh, biographical background. Uh, and it's a really slim volume, but what's really interesting is that uh, you can tell that she uh, really focused on baking because there's a lot of pastry and kind of sweet desserts and things like that. So uh, I wasn't quite sure in the conversation where that came up, but I just wanted to follow up with that uh, comment. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I shared the link. I'm just looking through some of the comments. Oh, there's a comment about emailing us the cheesecake recipe. <laughs> oh, is yeah. that in the book? I, I forget. Uh, no, it isn't in the book, but we'll okay. email that to your attention. And then if anybody wants okay, to Okay, perfect. Eat. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yes. And, and in that recipe, the crust is um, the Zweibeck, the baby crackers, that's what's used in the crust. Back then, I, they're hard, actually hard to find now, but that's what was the crust of the cheesecake. Yeah, because usually you don't kind of, you see that maybe like some, you know, like a graham crackery type, you know, come yeah. over. Yeah. Trust. Um, okay, so we have some really uh, detailed questions about your uh, cookbook. So if we kind of want to uh, dive right into it, Monica, I'm going to hit the first one. If you can see that we can kind of alternate. But uh, someone asked earlier in the evening, do you have plans for the future of your collection? What are you, uh, you going to do in terms of expanding your collection or focusing on any of your subgenres? That, that's my husband and I have discussed that because um, you know, I, I still collect books. There's, I have a list of very hard to find books that I'm looking for and they're quite pricey. Like what, uh, oh, what's what that had the hashes brownie recipe? Well, um, Alice B. Toklas' cookbook. Alice B. Toklas' cookbook. Her the her first cookbook it was printed uh, printed in the UK yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. it's like thousands of dollars <laughs> so I'll probably popular. you know if I surprisingly find it in a store on some bookshelf but we always looked at our books as an investment and we really haven't discussed what we'll do with the collection um, we that will be many years from now as yeah. they say. But one of the things we are looking at is, believe it or not, we have so many books that we, Pam kept pulling out saying, I want this in the book, I want this. 
we weren't able to do it. So in the back of our mind is another book called More Cookbook <laughs> Passion. So we'll see where that goes. But in, on a side note, when collecting cookbooks and sometimes the prices are out of my range. And one cookbook I was looking for, and it's extremely rare, extremely rare, is the National Cookbook by Sheila Hibben. And Sheila Hibben was the, served as the American food journalist for the New Yorker magazine the first 20 years. And the National Cookbook, one became available on eBay and with a dust jacket, which is impossible, impossible to find. They don't exist. Well, <laughs> It was up and I think it was $500. So I'm like, I, I couldn't afford to pay $500. I emailed the person that was selling this and I said, I explained to him my passion for books, of books and how I wanted this book so bad and that it would go to a home that was, would really welcome it. And I got it for less than half the price. So, you know, if you he knew I was true and sincere about my passion, so nobody else owns this book except me. <laughs> I was so excited to get, I have all three of her books, but yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> okay, so the next question is, what is the oldest cookbook you have? Oldest cookbook? Uh, how about that one Presbyterian church is the late 1890s. I don't care for the older books. I like... Um, my, I like my collection probably about the 19, starting 1930s. Of uh, the paper Ephemera, though, I do from Hood's Candy. I have some candy making ones from the late, eight, I think, 1890. So those of the paper Ephemera. <coughs> I think Pam likes the colorful ones and the ones that have interesting, but she has some actually uh, cookbooks that were done during the Prohibition, which are recipes that don't have any alcohol base in them. Yeah. No. Um, yeah, so we have a couple other questions. Uh, the next one is, uh, I think you touched on it a little bit in terms of uh, the first editions are different from the ones you actually, you know, kind of reference. But uh, do you cook from the books in your collection? And if you do, which, which ones are the favorites that you actually cook from? Oh, my God. <laughs> well, when I, I tell everybody, and I explained to you yesterday, I have what I call my cookbook cocoon. I will pull a bunch of cookbooks. They're on the uh, end table in our family room. While he's watching movies, I will thumb through and mark recipes. Um, yes, I do cook from all the books. I wish there was, you know, if I could buy one thing, I'd buy more time. But I really don't have a favorite. They're all my favorites. They're just, it's, I sometimes I get overwhelmed. I'm like, oh, I want to make this. I want to make this, but there's not enough time. But, and, and one of the things she's done over the years, she has binders out in the garage, which are by subject. And she has in, in protective folders, she has a recipe and then they all, she well, uses them over time. And there's one folder that is kind of the family heirloom of ones we do over and over. Well, what, what that, how that started was all my food magazines. I didn't want to save them all. So I would rip them apart. And so instead of putting them in a file folder, they went in page protectors. I got rid of the advertising. And I think I have over 30 binders of recipes from magazines. And, and if I try one, I mark it. If I don't like it, it goes in the garbage. But my older books, yeah, yes, there's so many, so many good recipes. And one thing I want to comment, I'll find a recipe that, like, not too long ago, a recipe came out from avocado ice cream. You know, the chefs were touting avocado ice, ice cream as something new. I, fold it, I found it in like a 1940 cookbook. So see how recipes kind of make the reappearance. Okay, and ready for the next question? Sure. Um, okay, so the next question, you kind of answered it a few minutes ago. How do you keep track of all of your cookbooks? Okay, well, I have an, on a database called bookcat.com, but they they're no longer exist. So I'm, there's another one I wanted kind of transpose them over to. Yes, you can scan the ISBN numbers if it has a barcode, but the older ones, no uh, catalog number. So that takes a time because I want all the dust jackets and pictures of the book on there. But in my library, my books are categorized, the current, the new, you know, cookbooks from like maybe the 1990s on, 
Like behind you, you see all my current cookbooks. So behind, you know, one whole section is baking. The next section is like the top is Italian. Um, and I, they're in order as you would travel around the world. So then you come to lower ones, the South, on the East Coast or on the other side. And as I did the same for my older vintage cookbooks. They are by category. Um, they're not alphabetized. They're not color coded by binders, they're by category. And an uh, interesting story, one of our friends that um, came over one time and he said, oh, my mom was good friends with this person. Um, I can't think of her name off the I said, oh, I have that book book. I went right upstairs, right, knew exactly where that book was on my shelf. And he's like, oh my God, how did you know that? But I know my collection so well, we, I know. We can play games by pulling out a name and then she'll point to where it is. And something I thought I wanted to start is and do on my, maybe my Facebook page. I wanted somebody to like, maybe I take a page of a, a bookshelf and say, pick a book and tell me, make something out of this book. And then I will make that recipe and post it. We also haven't had a Jules and Julia moment where we have somebody said, well, I'll cook every single recipe out of Pam's cookbook. <laughs> so we're open for that too. <laughs> oh yeah, talk to yourself. <laughs> Uh, we had another couple of questions. Uh, do you have any manuscripts cookbooks or are they all published volumes? Oh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, 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 all I'll published. Of course, of course, I have on the computer. I can sell Pam's manuscript, <laughs> but we'll send that to the Smithsonian first. <laughs> and then um, someone is asking which six states um, don't have cake orders and how do you buy the cake? Okay, how to buy the cake. Okay, the, I'd have to look at my friend. It's weird, it's um, Idaho, Wyoming, Oklahoma, I think Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Maine. It's, it's like, I don't know what, and just to give you an idea how much I make, I made over a thousand rolls last year. So I've got a big, <laughs> yeah, it keeps me busy and I, I get rave reviews about it. I'm, I'm very passionate about everything I make, I bake. Um, it's got to be the best possible quality. That's why people say, well, why don't you make this and send it? I'm like, no, nope, because that I want you to eat the day it's made. I don't care if it takes two days to send it and get it to you. It doesn't taste like it tastes the first day, so I won't do it. But petites is something that um, you can free, actually freezing it makes it better. I send a priority. It's, two to five days and, and actually the flavor gets better. So very happy with that. Yeah, and we'll put all your contact information again in, in the follow-up okay. email. So everyone will have that. And I encourage you to, to follow uh, them on Facebook, uh, Kitchen Astir, and you'll get to see all very tantalizing uh, images of, of the pizza as it gets um, baked and shipped and packed out. Um, just real quick, we have a couple other questions about your collection and then we'll wrap it up for the evening. I'm okay, sure. um, happy to stay on, but we will stop the recording after these next couple of questions. Uh, what is the strangest cookbook you own? <laughs> oh, I can move it. Oh, um, I don't know if I can show that. <laughs> um, I want, I should say, I guess it could be strange. Can you read that? Uh, it's called Fanny Hill's Cookbook. And the illustrations are, I can't show the illustrations. <laughs> Could I? No. Very ribald. It's yeah. one of the ways to think. What? Fanny Hill was a famous, uh, lavicious uh, movie. And so they did a cookbook after the movie. But if you can, you can only imagine the illustrations in this book. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> so we, I think that would be the, str the strangest. Um, I'm looking over at my, no, I think that would be. Okay, and one more question. Um, what is the most exotic ingredient that you've used in a recipe? Oh, let's see, God. Oh my God, exotic. I don't. Well, some of the. Uh... God, I, I've. Well, one of the things she recently did is she went through and changed out all her spices, which I thought yeah, was that's, an interesting. Yeah, but that's not exotic. Yeah, I'd have to. Um, We've had alligator. No, no, exotic <laughs> things I made. I, I honestly cannot answer that. I, 
you know, I, for instance, I'm making a recipe. Um, oh, she was the, it's called a bao cake. She was a, a pastry chef for Momo, uh, yeah, Momofuku. And in there, there's a recipe, a, a tiered cake where she takes corn and I bought dried corn. I'm going to grind that and that goes into a recipe. But I, I, I truthfully, I cannot think of the most exotic ingredient right now. There's a lot of the older recipes uh, use every part of the body and you can get some interesting recipes when you go back in that, especially when uh, America in the early 1800s had an abundance of everything. Terrapin was a very big deal. No longer you can do terrapin. Yeah, especially we know that from Maryland. Terrapin and terrapin soup is a big deal uh, here in Maryland. So we, we know that very well. Uh, so that is all of the questions. So I am going to just stop the recording, but we won't end the webinar just quite yet. We'll just let everyone ask any other comments or questions. Uh, so again, I just want to thank everyone and I will thank just you. stop the recording. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.